It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Val Peterson, Civil Defense Administrator. Mr. Peterson, our viewers remember you as the distinguished governor of Nebraska who was very active in the Eisenhower campaign. And now, sir, you are the one American who is most concerned with <coughs> how to protect American homes from possible atomic attack. And, sir, I believe you have observed the recent uh, atomic test out at Yucca Flats, and you've been extensively briefed by the various agencies of the government concerned with atomic attack. So tonight, sir, first of all, will you explain to our viewers just what the enemy is capable of doing to this country now? Well, I wouldn't want to attempt to scare the American people because I don't believe in scare tactics, but I do believe in telling the facts. And the facts are that we know that the Russians presently have enough airplanes of the proper type, bombers, and enough atomic bombs to drop one or more atomic bombs on every major metropolitan industrial area at one time, Simul me, make a simultaneous attack. Let me ask you this, Governor. Do you place any faith at all in this Russian peace offensive? Personally, I place none whatsoever. I think the president has stated the situation correctly. Uh, we're willing to listen to anything they have to say, but they must uh, give evidence of good faith by, by actions. But I personally believe that they're out to conquer the world and to destroy free governments everywhere. Well, and I, I would be inclined to disbelieve them myself. Well, sir, aside from the argument as to whether the <coughs> Russians mean well or not, tonight, sir, you are stating to our viewers that the Russians are now capable of, of striking simultaneously every important city in the United States. I, I wouldn't say every important city in the United States, but I'd say a large number of them. I would say every major metropolitan and, and area in the United States. That's the use of both aircraft and submarines, I assume. I would assume that when they strike, they would strike from the air. They would strike from submarines 50 to 100 miles off our coastline. They would uh, strike also with biological and bacteriological uh, uh, means. And, of course, a sabotage would be uh, now, inflicted upon our Now, cities. you, sir, are concerned uh, with how to meet that attack and how to cut down the damage of some such attack. My job is strictly that, yes, to minimize uh, the attack. I wanted to ask you this, Governor, too, before we get on with this. Uh, according to your calculations, what would be the best time, what would be the best year for the Russians to launch an attack on us? Have you made a study of that? Well, uh, that that's does not fall strictly within my sphere, but the information I have is that an attack this year would be uh, a likely time for one to come from that sort, from the Russian direction. Why is that, sir? Well, because uh, apparently their relationship to ours militarily is about as good from their standpoint this year as it will be in the foreseeable future. Well, you say I'm not attempting to pick yeah. the year, however. That's out of my province. But it is. You're stating that as a matter of fact, they, can, they are now capable of mounting the attack you have just explained. Now, sir, what can we do uh, to cut down the damage of such a, to reduce the damage of such an attack? What's the first thing that can be done? Well, the first thing that needs to be done in America must be done by the Air Force because it is its responsibility. It must develop better means of, of apprehending an enemy attack in order that we may have a longer warning because a longer war warning time obviously gives us an opportunity to do many it's, things. It's, you think that it's vital, it's vital that, that we have some, some warning of, of, the, of the attack? Yes, and as a matter of fact, the Air Force itself needs uh, all the warning that it can get. Governor, what part of the country do you consider most vulnerable to attack? Well, of course, uh, the, the uh, the eastern sea coast, the western sea coast, and the Great Lakes area, where the large concentrations of population and industry are located. Now, in, in making your plans to help each individual American reduce the danger of an attack, are you assuming that we will have uh, some warning of an approaching attack? At the present time, we're guaranteed uh, no warning other than possibly 15 to 30 minutes. 
But we're hopeful, and uh, there are steps underway to increase that warning time. Well, specifically now, sir, what can the average urban family in the United States, what can it do to help uh, increase its chances of survival under such an attack? Well, the first job for an urban family is to build some type of a shelter either in the basement of the house in which the family lives or out in the backyard. Well, and that can be an inexpensive type of a shelter. Now you're How far out would uh, the danger zone be? For example, suppose, uh, for example, I live in a suburban area. I live about 25 miles outside of a city. Uh, would I be in danger of attack there? Should I build a shelter? Uh, you certainly should build a, t a shelter, and I would say that you're in a reasonably good spot, 25 miles from the center of a metropolitan area. Well, what, what have your observations at Yucca Flats uh, indicated as to the effectiveness of shelter? Well, if you'll recall, out at Yucca Flats, we had constructed two houses, one 3,500 feet from the point of a blast, atomic blast, and another one 7,500 feet. The building, the house, which was located 3,500 feet from the atomic blast, was just absolutely shattered in a matter of split seconds. But we had placed a dummy in a, behind a shelter in the basement, a very cheap lean-to type of shelter that was built, actually, for about $46. That dummy was absolutely undisturbed. The radiation was, at, was lower in the inside of, in the basement than it was at, outs at the outside. And had a person been behind that uh, shelter and remained there, uh, he or she would have been saved. Now, are you advising every family that lives in a major city to make shelter, some sort of underground shelter, a primary consideration at this time? Underground or in the basement, yes. And, and, and if you're in the basement, or some way underground, you have a much better chance of survival than you have if you were on top of the a, ground. A much better chance, and of course, I, I, no one can guarantee that if you happen to be at the point where an atomic bomb explodes, that uh, you can you can have find safety. That uh, that sort of a guarantee can't be made. Well, Governor, how about suppose you're in an office building? Is an office building a relatively safe place to be, or in a, an atomic attack? If you're in an office building, the thing to do is to get away from the windows and to get into the inside corridors of the building, or to get away from flying glass, and to get as far down in the building as you can get. You're safer in an office building than in your own home, though. Is that true? That depends on the location of your home. Of course, your home, 25 miles out in the country, I think would be a pretty safe place. Unless they misplaced a bomb. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, now, coming back to responsibility for protection, sir, uh, where does the responsibility lie? You, as the, as the fed chief federal officer, do you have the responsibility of alerting no. the people in the country? The real responsibility for civil defense rests with the mayors of our cities and villages in America and with the governors of the states. And my responsibility as the federal director of civil defense is to boil down all of the information that we can get from scientific agencies in and outside of the government, from governmental departments, information that is not available in the 48 state capitals for obvious reasons. Governor, I read... Boil it down, simplify yes. it, and get it out to the people. I read somewhere that uh, you believe that uh, secrecy is too strong a policy, military s secrecy in our government, and that the people aren't being told what they should know about Russia and about the weapons of war in case we would have an attack. Is that true? I think that's a relatively correct statement, and I believe strongly that we should give to the American people every bit of information we can, short of giving the enemy uh, comfort and assistance, uh, with respect to enemy weapons, enemy capabilities, and uh, generally as much information as we can. There's quite a lot being hidden in that regard. Well, I, I, I wouldn't want to say a lot, but I feel more than is necessary. Well, as, as a government official yourself, no, no one's holding back anything from you, are they, sir? No, they are not. And just as rapidly as I can get over the government, I'm being briefed, and I think very fully, by the people who are in authority. Would you care to divulge a few secrets on Chronoscope? I certainly would not. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, uh, you, uh, you haven't found that there's any policy of secrecy as I far as I've found no conspiracy is. of se secrecy as far as I'm concerned. However, I'm not privileged to say uh, everything that I learned. You think the Army is overclassifying? Is that it, this, in so far as secrecy? I think that the Army has a tendency to overclassify, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, what you're, you, you, you are alerting the people uh, tonight in an every statement you make as far as, as to the nature of the danger that confronts us. That's the right, and I expect to continue to do that just as far as I possibly can within security requirements.
Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, the, my opinion in that direction is the same as many other people in the government of Washington. Well, what can you say, sir? What can you say, sir, as to the state of civil defense now? Are, are people rather complacent about it? Or I would are you say making that progress. The, I would say that civil defense in America is inadequate as of the moment. But I should also say that if you put it in the right perspective, bearing in mind that the that the idea of uh, atomic energy is relatively new in the world and that the idea of dropping bombs from uh, uh, heavy bombers is an in, has completely revolutionized military strategy. If you bear that in mind and put it into its right frame of reference, the remarkable thing is not that we have not solved the problem, but that we've done as well as we have up to the present time. Well, as, as a final question, uh, sir, uh, to our individual uh, viewers tonight, to the American family that wants to do something about this problem, uh, what is your advice? Well, the first thing that every American should do is learn to, do, to take the steps that are necessary to protect his own hide, if I can use that word, and to protect his loved ones. Secondly, to protect his community, and thirdly, to protect the industry with which he is associated. And civil defense is nothing mysterious. Civil defense is merely the extension of already existing community services, fire departments, police departments, transportation, communication, mass feeding, medical uh, uh, programs. And each man is a better citizen for peacetime as well as for wartime if he, if he trains himself in those regards. Well, thank you, sir, for being with us this evening. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Val Peterson, Civil Defense Administrator. It was painted by Whistler in 1872 and called Portrait of His Mother. Today it is recognized, like the carnation, as a symbol of Mother's Day. As an honest gift to mother on Mother's Day, many loving sons and daughters buy Longines watches. For those who have this idea, Longines Whitnor jewelers are making special displays of their loveliest watches. For mother, on Mother's Day, for any important gift occasion, the world's most honored watch is Longines, the world's most honored gift. Every Longines watch shares the fame of the honored name Longines. Among the world's finest watches, Longines alone has been honored by 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals, has been equally honored for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now, whatever your needs in a watch, the name Longines is your assurance of superior performance. Each of these magnificent creations is for mother, for you, is powered by the fame Longines watch movement, built for greater accuracy and longer life through superior workmanship. Now remember, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, <coughs> and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, agency for Longines Whitnor watches. Tuesday night thrills danger on the CBS television network.